Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another Sound United Global Training Webinar. Today, we're putting Polk Audio in the spotlight. As you may have heard, seen, and read, this Tuesday, we launched a brand new reserve series, and we have invited some experts in the field. So joining us today are all familiar faces. We have Michael Greco, our Senior Director of Category Management Loudspeakers. Welcome to the webinar, and thank you very much for your time. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over now to our host, Phil, who is joining us from his new office in Carlsbad. Take it away, Phil. Yay! I am actually finally in the office. So after a year of doing these webinars, I get to actually be in the office with all of the gear. And I am super excited today because Michael is here to talk about a new lineup of speakers. And the nice thing about being in the office is we have all the speakers here so we can actually talk about them and go through all of the different models as well as all of the technology so michael how are you sir good morning phil i'm doing great well i am i'm excited because we are launching a new lineup of speakers from polk audio and i know that you have worked years on these and you are very excited to talk about the, um, the speakers and and what you have done. But the first thing you want to talk about is basically, um, can you give us a basic history of Polk? We have some fans here, but just in case they don't understand some of the cool things, I think it's good for you to talk about it. Sure. I mean, so Polk has been around for a while. So Polk was founded in 1972. And what some people don't realize when I talk to them is that it was actually founded by a gentleman, by, well, actually, there were the three folks that founded it, but it was named after. The head engineer, a guy named Matthew Polk. So Matthew Polk was never the CEO, was never the, the finance guy. He was always the mad scientist behind the scenes, kind of creating the speakers. They got their business started with sound reinforcement speakers for musicians. And they, those musicians liked the speakers so much, Matthew Polk and his guys wanted to make speakers for just every for the consumer market. And so they they had this vision that they wanted to create speakers that image incredibly well, like a British loudspeaker. And they also wanted to have speakers that had that kind of front row concert experience with um, with effortless bass and a really smooth mid-range. And that's that's kind of the, the premise of what they've been trying to do since 1972. And so for almost 50 years now, whether it's a sound bar or a component loudspeaker, that's been the vision um, of that. And the other thing that's always kind of overlaid all of it was, they wanted to make speakers that were affordable, that, that the average person could buy and enjoy and, and that were easy to set up. And so, you know, they're never the cheapest loudspeakers that are out there, but they always were a good value for money. And so that's still a very important to Polk today to kind of give you the, the Matthew Polk performance and then also give you the value. And the combination of those two things, I think, is what makes Polk very special. Yes. And when I first joined Sound United a couple of years ago, I got the, the, the hangout with Brendan. He's kind of the head of engineering and he had a pair of pokes in his, um, in his office. And for two or three days, all we did was rock out on the, on the original flagships that were back a couple of years ago, the LSIMs. And I was stunned at their overall performance, especially for the price points that, that, um, that they were going for, because you would have to spend double. It seems like every time I do a poke speaker, you got to spend at least double to get the same performance, whether it's one of the flagship models or even one of the mid-level models. The performance always is bigger than, than what you would expect. And now we have a whole new series of speakers that are designed to bring Polk to even a, a wider group of a, a wider audience. So can you talk about the reserve? Sure. So let's just kind of back up a little bit. Um, in October 2019, we introduced a new flagship series for Polk called Legend. In that series, if, if you aren't familiar with it, we developed new transducers. We developed a new tweeter, a new mid-bass driver. We also took one of our core technologies, PowerPort, and we built upon that. We call it Enhanced PowerPort. So when we were thinking about this new line, we, the, we started with the premise that we want to take the raw ingredients, those transducers and pieces from Legend, and use that as the foundation for the acoustic performance of this line. So with that in mind, we literally, with Reserve, we're using the same tweeter. We did not reduce the cost on it. We didn't modify it. To, to So a lot of times when um, other speaker brands, they have a kind of a flagship tweeter, they'll cost it down to bring it to a lower line. 
We didn't do any of that. Same thing with the cone, the turbine cone. We took the exact turbine cone. We took enhanced power port, those types of things. And we wanted to start those with the base raw ingredients. In addition to that, the engineering team in Baltimore, which is the um, uh, passive loudspeaker team, they basically had some new technology that they wanted to bring to market as well. So in addition to just not just taking those core elements from Legend, they also had some um, actually patent pending technology, some new things that they had developed that they wanted to bring to the line. So with that, it's kind of the basis for the, the platform. What we want to do then we want, we're thinking about where should we, where should this line fit overall? So in Polk, we have a signature series, which kind of peaks out at about, you know, thousand dollars a pair for a pair of towers. And then we immediately jump to Legend, which kind of starts about 3,500 a pair. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to have something that's slotted right in the middle. And so that's what we ended up with reserve. So the largest tower in reserve is $2,000 a pair. So it's almost, it's about 40% of where Legend was. And that was the goal. We originally set out, we said, could we get to about 50% of the of the SRP, the, the, the suggested retail price of Legend on comparable models? We didn't quite get there. We got to about 40%, so we're really happy because we didn't want to compromise performance. We didn't want to dumb down the tweeter. We didn't want to dumb down the cone. We wanted to focus on those things. So what we created was a line that's really quite large. You'll see from the on-screen picture that it is got three floor standing speakers. It's got three center channels, two bookshelves, and a height module. And one of the reasons we did this was that we wanted to build a line that had it was very high performance, but could meet most people's needs. You have a two channel need, we've got you covered. You wanna build a 13 channel um, home theater system with height modules and height channels, we've got you covered. And that's very different than Legend, and that's very different than even Signature at this point. Mm -hmm. So we so just to step back, it's got all the raw ingredients of Legend, so it has great performance. It's got it can meet most people's needs in most houses. It covers all your all the situations that you could have possibly have. And then um, we think it's great value. Um, and when you compare it to other products in the marketplace, whether it's listening or aesthetically, or just the ability to configure it however you want, we think it offers great value. One of the things that Phil just put on the screen was some accolades that um, that Legend received. And so we, we did this just because a lot of people don't read these publications. These are audio file publications that, um, you know, you, you really are a hardcore enthusiast. You might read these, but what was really interesting was these are audio file publications and they measure speakers and they do extensive listening tests. And we, we sent um, Legend in for review and they came back with incredibly positive accolades about Legend. And, and that just reinforced that what we already knew and believed, which was we had a great product on our hand. And so that's why we wanted to take those raw ingredients and put them into something that this makes it a little bit more accessible to more people. Um, and the other thing, and, and so that's what Reserve is all about. It's all about great sound. It's all about being able to support a home theater to a two channel. And it's all about making it so it's really accessible to a lot of people from a price standpoint. Yeah. Well, the, well, the big thing too is we're already starting to get reviews um, and feedback from reviewers and listeners about the reserve, and those reviews have been outstanding as well. So, and um, and and that is we've had European press look at them, we've had American press look at them, and the um, consensus is they sound amazing, um, like you would expect, um, playing um, performing well beyond what you would expect at the particular price points they're at. And that really shows the mastery that the Polk engineers have of optimizing the performance of the, of the speakers they're building at the price points that they're working on. So, 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 so since I have this huge um, collection of speakers behind me, why don't we kind of go through um, the line, Mike, and talk about sure. some of the models that are behind me, okay? Sure. So, sure. You wanna start with the towers? Yeah, so what is this guy right here? So the big boy on the right is the R9, or R700, excuse me. And the R700 retails for $1,000 each, $2,000 a pair. It's available in that black finish that you see, as well as a, a walnut finish, a brown walnut. All the speakers are wrapped in vinyl. There is um, one of, uh, that's one of the differences between Legend and Reserve is, Legend is real wood veneer. These are all wrapped in vinyl. 
with uh, the R700, uh, you'll notice it has at the very top the ring radiator tweeter, and then it has below it the turbine cone. That's a six and a half inch turbine cone, and below that you've got two eight inch woofers. Um, this speaker, um, we can't see it, but the feet, it, it's an aluminum base, and you, you can actually see in this a little bit in the picture, rubber stoppers on the feet. So you can put that on a hard floor, or like a wood or a, or a stone floor. But then if you pop those off, you actually have spikes. And if you look down the top, you'll see there's an Allen key for leveling. So they come prefixed with either spikes or rubber pads. This speaker is uh, has dual binding posts. So if you're into bi-amping or bi-wiring, you can, uh, you can uh, bi-amp or bi-wire that speaker. And um, it's, a, it's, it's a really amazing speaker. It plays very low. Um, it has a very flat frequency response. It embodies all the things that are Polk. It's gonna give you amazing detail. It has a very smooth mid-range. It has really deep effortless bass. Um, and it's, it's just a wonderful sounding loudspeaker. I use the, so I'll just kind of deviate a little bit and I always share the stories. Like I got to interview Matthew Polk. Um, uh, he's a wine connoisseur. I'm a wine connoisseur. Um, that's part of the, where the name reserve comes from. And, um, uh, I was asking him to describe the Polk sound. And one of the words he kept on using when describing the Polk sound, in particular, the bass was effortless bass. So when I use those words, I'm not just using those as kind of uh, marketing words. I'm using those same words that he used to describe um, the, the sound. So I just thought I'd share that with you. It's kind of a little inside baseball, but um, but so, and, and, and this speaker absolutely embodies those elements. Um, it also includes power port. It's a down firing port. Um, that's why you'll notice the aluminum base is offset from the ground. And you can see that in the, in the, in the pictures. Um, and then inside that, when we'll get to it, there's a new patent pending technology called export. And so we'll, we'll go through all of that. All the grills that you see on all these products are magnetic. Um, so, if you're, so not, no questions there. Um, the next speaker to your left is in white. And so, it's, so you, that speaker is called the R600. In the US, it retails for $7.99 each. And it's available in three colors. It's available in the black, white, and the brown walnut. There you're looking at um, again, the ring radiator tweeter and dual um, cascaded six and a half inch mid base drivers and woofers. Um, that that product um, is is a wonderful sounding product. What you, basically what you're doing with that product, if you think about it, the top half is really a six and a half two way bookshelf, and the bottom half is your woofer. So if you like the imaging of the bookshelf, but you want it to play a little lower, that's the speaker that you want to buy. Um, and um, Single binding post, again, the base is aluminum. It also has power port, enhanced power port, plus the export on it. And um, it incorporates all the technologies that we have in um, all the transducer technologies, excuse me, that we have in Legend. And um, the one to the left of it is the little guy. And the little guy has um, a height module sitting on top of it. You can see that. Uh, and the little guy is basically, it's, it's called the R500. It retails for $5.99 each. Again, it's available in all three colors, and it's using five and a quarter, dual five and a quarters. And we put the height module on top of it because it's the smallest model, so you can see how it fits very, uh, fits perfectly on top of it. You obviously fit on the other um, uh, floor standards as well. Um, that height module it has dual functions. It can sit on top of the speaker, or if you turn it over, actually, there it is on top. And on the back, you'll notice that we have um, both a uh, keyhole slot and a quarter 20 threaded insert. So you can wall mount this. Underneath the binding post, you'll see a slider switch. And that slider switch allows you to tell the speaker, is this going on top of a speaker or going on the wall? And so this is why we call it a height module is because it's not, it can be a topper or an on-wall speaker. Um, and so the purpose of that is obviously is it can you can use it for anything that you would a surround a satellite uh, on wall it is not full range so we you do not want to use it as a um, front stage um, because it's it's not a full range speaker but uh, it works perfectly obviously with any of the towers and then the large book it will fit on top of that the small book you could put it on top of it but it's going to hang over the edge it's not going to look that great um, but you could make do if that's something that you wanted to try the um, the small go ahead Bill 
Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. The small speaker is a little different than the other two in that it doesn't actually have power port. It has just the X port and it it's, it's fires off the rear. And we'll get into a little bit more about why we chose to put power port on some and not on others. And put all the speakers in the lineup that have that are ported, because there are two that are not, all the speakers that are ported, actually there's three that are not, um, have X port, which is this new patent pending technology. Okay, so let's go on and talk about the bookshelves. So we have a so we talked about the height module already. Yep. So and now let's talk about the about the bookshelves that we have here. So so let's go through those real quick. Sure. So you're seeing um, the small five and a quarter inch two way bookshelf. You're seeing it in the uh, brown walnut. So that's probably your first glimpse of the walnut. We have a center channel that's in it, so you can see it a little uh, later. Um, and so that's a wonderful sounding speaker. Generally, you know the small books. Uh, their their claim to fame and this part of the polk signature sound is is imaging and so the small books image wonderfully you know small speakers tend not to play as loud and as low but they tend to image incredibly well and that and this one is uh actually lives up to that promise and when you look at it again you'll see the uh one inch uh ring radiator tweeter the pinnacle tweeter and you'll also see five and a quarter inch um uh, uh mid-bass driver to the left of it is the larger book, the R200, and we have it in two colors. It comes in all three. It comes in the brown, the white, and the black, um, and that's the R200, and that's the six and a half inch two-way bookshelf. Um, it's, again, it's that one also images incredibly well, plays a little lower. Um, so it's these are wonderful um, products if you don't want to have a full um, floor standard in your home. That one also, is, you'll, we're going to turn it around because we're going to later, when we start talking about the tech, you can see on the back, it has a very unusual looking port. And that unusual port is the export. Um, and the export, uh, we'll talk about it in more detail, does kind of three things. It can reduce both port and cabinet resonances, which are unwanted vibrations, which make sound. It also can reduce the actual um, port noise that you get coming out of a port. And if you call power port, its primary job was to reduce that port noise. And so you don't, in, in bookshelves and smaller speakers, you're not making as much port noise. And so the export actually does a very good job with that. And we didn't actually need power port to do that. So we'll go a little bit more detail on that. You can see put the grills on top, but they're all magnetic. And then, like I said, the, the top of the large speakers will work with the height module. Did I leave anything out, um, Phil? No, 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 that's good. We're going we're gonna to right. go into more detail about the, um, the technologies that are built into these the speakers and the bookshelves and the, the cones and the power port and the and the export a little bit later but i just want to kind of go through the lineup so right. the next thing we want to talk about is the center channels because you mentioned that there was a large amount of, yeah. of center channels we have three center channels here so right. so let's go through and talk about those so unlike the towers where we kind of went small medium large right the center channels we looked at specific situations in your home where you're sitting there going okay what, how do i make this work right so the first thing just to highlight is in the middle one that phil's standing by in, in the walnut the wood grain finish is the compact center and the reason we call it the compact center is it's got two five and a quarter so it's not small and underpowered but what it's designed to do is to go into most av cabinets most av consoles or cabinets have a little shelf underneath the top that's designed to hold a center channel. So we went out and we measured and we wanted to make sure that we had a center channel that fit most of those cabinets. This center channel is a sealed box. So meaning there's no ports on it. And that'll mean it's very forgiving in terms of where it's placed. So you can put it in that shelf and not worry about port noise disrupting or making noise or causing um, problems. You could obviously stick it on top of, a, on top of your credenza or the AB console uh, as well or you could get a uh, center speaker stand. But most people will probably put it in that shelf if they have a dedicated um, uh, AV cabinet. The next one on the left in white is the R350. And that one's a little bit, that one's really special and it's a little bit unusual. First of all, let's talk about it. It's long and thin and not very tall. Um, it's only about six inches deep. If I recall correctly, it's about six inches tall. And the reason we did that is because there are a number of people that mount their TV and they actually don't have any furniture underneath it. Or perhaps they only have a fireplace with a mantle underneath it. And mantles typically are six to eight inches deep, at least. Uh, and so what we wanted to do was build a speaker that would work in those situations. So that speaker, not only is it shallow, 
so that it can sit on a mantle and it's also not that tall so we also put mounting brackets on the back of it so if you look at the back of it you'll see that there are um, four-way keyhole slots on the back those are heavy duty metal brackets and the idea is that you could mount this under the tv you don't have to have furniture or a stand you'll also notice that they're four-way and so we actually characterize this as an lcr meaning you could use it as a left center or right and the reason for that is again there's some people that don't have um, the ability to have to put things on furniture and so this gives you that flexibility if you wanted to use it one of the things that we did in considering that the use case particularly of a vertical mounting is the grill the magnetic grill has a logo on it well what happens when you actually mount it vertically now the logo is turned 90 degrees well one of the things that we did was we made the logo magnetic it's actually removable and you can reposition and change the logo so now if you're mounting it vertically the logo is correct some instances you might want to take the logo off obviously i'm biased towards the logo but clearly if you want to keep it you can you can move it or remove it and that's one of the nice things about that piece um we actually introduced this concept of we called it a slim center with the signature series back in 2000 uh, i believe it's late 2015 and it was so popular what we noticed was that people were buying this and they weren't buying the other speakers in the line so clearly there was an absolute need to be able to provide us a center channel that would work in a lot of situations where a traditional center channel wouldn't work and so we wanted to bring that idea forward into reserve now the big difference between this and signature is this is using um, four inch drivers versus three inch drivers because we wanted to be able to keep up with the towers and the books um, uh, considering that it is obviously smaller, both in cabinet volume and in drivers. The last speaker is for maximum performance. This is the guy that you go to when space is not an option and you you just want the best. And this is, yeah, go ahead and pick that up, Phil. <laughs> no. uh, uh, so um, yeah, don't hurt yourself. So this is the big boy, right? And so he, he's designed for maximum performance. So he's featuring Oh, by the way, just on the on the on the R three hundred and fifty, the the thin white one, it is again a sealed box. So again, it's 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 designed to be wall mounted, so you don't have to worry about ports firing into the wall and all that kind of good stuff. The big boy has X port on it, and it is ported. It's dual ported in the back, and it's featuring two six and a half inch uh, mid base drivers plus the one inch tweeter. It pairs amazingly well with the um, R seven hundred R six hundreds because those are both also using six and a half inch mid base drivers um, or and woofers um, so this is the one you go to when you want to create the ultimate home theater system you put the r 700s as your front stage you put the r 400 which is your center channel in the middle and then you can choose whatever you want for your satellites and surrounds uh, and your yeah. head modules yeah so, so very very yeah a very very um extensive um, lineup of speakers so like you said if you're looking so pretty much a solution for for everyone. So, um, and like I said, I love the, the slim the slim center or the slim LCR mm -hmm. because um, a couple of weeks ago, or a couple of months ago, one of my friends called me and said he was looking for a um, uh, an LCR combination because a lot of houses in California and probably around America and other places they built these little um, um, holes that you put your TV in. And they were saying, how big is a TV ever going to be? So let's make it this size. And as the TVs get bigger and bigger and bigger, the place or the, 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 the space you have to put speakers beside it got smaller and smaller and smaller. So, so those LCRs work really well in a lot of situations. And like I said, the finishes are, are like I said, uh, depending on the model, black, white, black, matte white, or walnut and the walnut is actually a nice now these are veneer finish right this is one of the ways that no, you no, can no, they're, they're vinyl no, vinyl this vinyl. is an embarrassment i get the v's Le right this legend is vinyl. Wood veneer these are vinyl <laughs> and just on the colors just so we know the colors might not all be available in your country so if you're calling in from europe or you're call or you're looking at this in another country you want to check with your local dealer because they might not bring in all the colors but the only models, by the way, that are not available in white um, globally is the 
large floor standard, the R700, and the large um, uh, center channel, the R400. All the other models are available, all three colors. Those two models are only available in, um, in the black and the brown walnut. Um, okay. and, and that was just a conscious decision on our part. So I got the V's mixed up, but what I was trying to say is by utilizing a vinyl instead of a veneer is one of the ways that you could reduce the overall, um, the, the cost of the product, right? Because you were talking yeah. about that goal of, of reaching, of bringing that great poke sound to more customers. Right. So you can, so by changing from a real wood veneer to a vinyl, you're not affecting performance, right? But it's, it, um, and the other thing is, I mean, you, you look at Legend, right? The cabinets are far more intricate, right? It has a chamfer around the front. There's, um, you know, a high polish, you have both combination of veneer and paint. You have the detailing of the power port on the R600 and R, R sorry, the L600 and L800. You know, you have this this gap in the bottom, and that that actually is a high polish. It's a lot of um, it's a it's it's very intricate, and all that detail makes it look amazing, but it that all costs a lot of money. And so part of what we wanted to do with the design here was we wanted to kind of go at three different things. We had three different goals. The first thing we wanted to do was we wanted it to be modern. So you'll notice that the front baffle, that's the front angle when you're looking at it. Um, is it's, it goes right up to the edge of the trim rings on the, on the drivers, right? So it's much narrower than a traditional speaker. If you put this next to Signature or Legend, it's much narrower. So we went a little deeper because we needed the cabinet volume, but that gives it a little bit more modern aesthetic. It also makes it a little more spousal friendly, right? Your, your significant other might say, oh, that's not too bad. That's not too big. I can put that in the living room. Um, and so we wanted to have a modern. We also wanted modern finishes. So Polk has traditionally always had a wood grain finish. So it was really important that we had a wood grain finish, but traditionally Polk hasn't done solid colors. It hasn't done, except for on things like subwoofers and subsat systems or sound bars. It traditionally has been almost all exclusively all wood grain. If you look at Legend, there's it's all wood grain. If you look at Signature, it's all wood grain. Um, so we wanted to have some solid colors in particular black, and we have never really done white in a speaker um, of like a solid white. So we wanted to do that. So we wanted modern, um, both in color and in ID. And then we also wanted to, at the same time, simplify the cabinet so we could, um, we wanted to spend the money on performance. We wanted to spend the money on transducers and on the power port and the base, which is aluminum. It's real, it's a real aluminum piece. Um, there's no plastic on this, um, and, and as opposed to spending it just on the aesthetic. So we kind of, we went down that path and that's how we ended up where we ended up with reserve. Um, so it, it has, it has almost all the performance of Legend, so it's near flagship sound, and it has really modern look and at about 40% of the cost. Yeah. So one analogy that 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 um that I really liked was we were talking about um, furniture. You go out and you get a beautiful um, couch or sofa, um, great springs, hardwood frame, um, everything about it is really really nice. But when you go from the fabric to a high-end leather, you could double the price um, in that in that experience, and that's kind of what's going on here. Is by by making um, uh, selective creative um, adjustments to things such as finishes, they were able to bring a lot of the performance that you see on their higher-end flagship model to even more customers. I always also use I'm a car guy. I use the Porsche analogy a lot. You know, 911 is kind of the pinnacle. And when they tell Porsche engineers to go build a car, they throw everything they can at a 911 because they can use the best leather and the best of the best of the best. Right. But not everybody could reach that thing. So that's why they have boxers and, and, and Cayman. Um, a lot of the, the, the technologies, the opposed, the boxer engine with the opposed pistons, the motors in the back, the whole thing, you yeah. still get the Porsche experience, but now you can bring that experience down to more customers and reach more people. Right. Okay. So before we go into the technology, because we're going to go down that rabbit hole, that's why I have Michael here. Do we have any, um, any more basic questions about the lineup, Fred? Actually, we do. Um... One question about the name. We all named the previous series were RTIS and LSIM. So LSIM became Legend. RTIA, mm -hmm. sorry, RTIA became Reserve. Why right. the name Reserve? Why Reserve? 
So let me, I'm going to answer your question. And I'm going to also give you a little bit more than you were expecting. So, <laughs> um, so traditionally, Polk had a whole bunch, they always used just letter names, TSI, TSX, RTI, LSIM, I could go on and on. They also had some other names that were really, you know, um, you look at the old SDA line, it was acronym soup, right? So one of the things we started was we moved away from that with signature series um, and then with legend. Ironically, legend and LSIM both start with L and RTI and reserve both start with R. That was not the intent. It just happened to work out that way. Um, the, the name reserve, I made it up. <laughs> so I am a wine connoisseur. I love wine. And so I was actually, I don't remember if I was drinking wine at the time, but I have a fairly large wine cellar. And when you look at wines from Vintners, they will call it the reserve, Vintners Vint Vint Reserve, right? And so reserve in my mind has a very special meaning. Now, some other people might think it has other connotations, like you know, this is usually, um, it's something you hold back. But um, when I looked at the, the wine industry in particular, reserve meant something very special. And I wanted this to be, there you go, <laughs> look at that. So I wanted this to be, something special. And I knew, and I wanted it to also work in such that, that, so Legend was based off the legendary SDA. That's where the name came from. I was working with the engineers and we were just talking about it and we kept on referring to legendary SDA, legendary. And I'm like, why don't we just call it Legend? With this line, what was important was that in some, in some countries, this might be the flagship line for Polk. And so I wanted a name that could work as a flagship name, but I also wanted to have a special connotation, meaning that this was not something that was just average, that we just threw it together. It, it, was, it was something that was very thoughtful and we spent a lot of time and energy to, to really craft this. And that's where that name comes from. Now, one thing I wanna make, you did make a comment about RTI. This is, yes, it's kind of in that same positioning as RTI, meaning between, um, uh, legend and signature. Um, and before that, that would have been between LSIM and TSX for the old school pulp guys. Um, but there's a fundamental difference between reserve and RTIA. RTIA, even though it occupied that space, had almost no relationship to the flagship product, right? Think about that. There, the tweeter in RTIA was not the same ring radiator tweeter, was not even a ring radiator tweeter that was in LSIM. The mid base drivers, woofers, power port were all different. So there was no trickle down, right? There was no relationship. That's the fundamental difference between reserve and legend is that reserve embodies the, the, the raw ingredients of legend. It embodies those transducers, that tweeter from it. That's the relationship that it has. And that's what makes it very different between the RTI LSIM relationship that was out there. And um, I think that's an important distinction because I have had a lot of the old Polk guys go, isn't this just a replacement of RTA? It's like, yes and no. Yeah, it occupies that position, but the philosophy behind the development effort and the, and the way we developed the product was radically different than what we did with RTIA. Yeah, and that's a big point. That's why I like that, that couch analogy. <laughs> you know, it's if you took the couch apart and you looked at the couch and you look at the materials and the the parts that made up that couch is very similar. It was right. just like the fabric, the skin, right. you know, right. is what made it cost. So, so that's something that I thought is kind of cool. Right. And so it if is you're hoping cool. for a really good reason for the name, I'm sorry, but that's what the name came from. <laughs> he was drinking the wine and said, hey, I'll, but I like the name. I think the name works really, really good. Yeah. So any other questions, Frederick, before we move on to the yes. next? That's cool. Actually, that brings us to the next question about the base drivers of the L700. Are these identical as in the legend? No. The woofers in the R700 are different than the woofers that are in the um, in the uh, L600 and L800. Um, the L600, I believe, has seven inch woofers and the, uh, R, the L800 has 10 inch. So they are different. They are different actually material. Um, the motor structure behind them is very similar, but there is a little difference in the motor structure behind them. And then the other place where there are differences is we tune everything individually. Um, so just I'll to go off a little tangent here. So we have two engineering facilities for Polk. Uh, one is in Baltimore, Maryland. The other is in California. In California, we have the electronics group in Baltimore, Maryland. It's primarily electrical, mecha uh, it's a mechanical, industrial design, acoustics. Um, in Baltimore, they have the ability to 
prototype anything. We have our own wood shop. We have our own 3D printers. We have our own. We can. So um, the, they literally what they do is they develop something um, on the computer. They model it all on the computer, and then they go and they prototype it, and then we listen. And then when we listen, we determine is that what we intended to do. If not, we go and try and figure out what we don't like. We do more measurements. We do more prototyping, and it's a rinse and repeat type of process. Um, so in the case of of these products, um, it's all about you know getting it right. It's all about those that attention to detail. Yeah, and you can you can okay. see it when you when you when you feel them and touch them and and actually listen to them. They sound amazing. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say we have many more questions. Do we have time, or do you guys want to go on with the well, next? Let's topic? go on, and then we'll and then we'll come back and tackle some more as we go along. Um, so, so I do want to talk a little bit about like we were talking about the design. Like Mike, had, Michael's been talking about how they were sitting around designing them and and the conversations they have. So we want to talk a little bit about um, designing the reserve and just basically Polk's overall design philosophy. So Scott Orth was uh, on one of our calls, and he was talking about some of these core principles. Can you can you talk a little bit about this, Michael? Right, so if you think about, at the beginning I talked about how, you know, Matthew Polk described the sound and, and, the, and the goals that we have. And obviously, depending on, you know, how much money we can spend, you know, it depends on what we do with this, right? So at the beginning we talked about having, you know, detailed imaging, really big sound stage, smooth mid-range, effortless bass, right? Well, to get that, we need to think about these four things, right? And so tone, which is how things sound, timing means that like when the tweeter applies energy and the mid-bass woofer has energy, does it get to you approximately at the same time? So you don't have any uh, issues with that, bass issues. And then the blending, how does the blend, how do we blend the woofers, the mid-bass drivers and the tweeters together? Because the blending is very important because if you don't blend it right, you might have too much energy at one particular point, at one frequency. And then that makes things stand out. It can muddy things up, and you'll and you'll lose either um, you'll lose clarity from your imaging standpoint, or you might end up having uh, it might be fatiguing to listen to. So we take all of these things, and these are it, it, this is why speakers is kind of a combination of art and science, right? When I describe the the process, yes, you can model things on a computer, and yes, you can measure it, and it can be a flat line. But we have built prototype speakers that and and also measured competitors that may measure flat but they don't sound very good and then we have other speakers that kind of are all over the map and they sound great and so part of what you're trying to do is that's why it's so important that you not just because if there was only one way to make a speaker there wouldn't be so many brands right and everybody would have the same speaker that all sounds the same and they don't sound the same right you can take the same speaker with the same amplifier with the same content in the same room and you can hear the difference. So what we do is we obviously build it the way we think it's supposed to be built, and but most importantly, we listen. And we listen thinking about tone, time, blending, and imaging in particular. Um, and, and if those things all come together the way we want them to, that's the Polk sound. And we describe that sound as I mentioned before, where detailed imaging, big sound stage, think about SDA and the big sound stage that that throws off. You know that smooth mid-range. Matthew Polk was obsessed with having that really smooth mid-range, and then that effortless bass. Um, and you'll notice we focus a lot on bass because there's a lot of technologies in Polk that are all focused on ports and on bass management. And so we do we spend a lot of time and energy there because we don't want it boomy, and we don't want it to be muddying the mid-range. So there's a but we also want to have a lot of extension there. So it's this balance that we go through. So, so like I said, we're going to talk a little bit now about the, the different technologies that are built into um, um, Polk, the, the Polk spirit, um, these Polk speakers, the reserves. Um, and a lot of these technologies we've covered um, um, previously in the uh, launch of Legend when, when Michael was here. But there's also a couple of cool new technologies that we're going to cover as well. So, so like I said, one thing that's kind of unique about Polk is, like I said, they prototype and they build with um, their own components. So they design their own components, um, design for Polk, you know, you know, it's our stuff. And we're going to go through and we're going to talk a little bit about each one of these different um, technologies. And like I said, a lot of these technologies you will, you, um, you will find in the flagship, the legend. You will see all three of these in the legend. 
So these components, the tweeter, is the same tweeter. The turbine coned woofer is the same woofer, um, but the, I mean, mid base driver and mid range. But of course, like he said, the big, the big base drivers in the legend compared to the reserve are different. And the cabinetry is different and things like that. So we're going to so talk, up, go ahead. Yeah, so absolutely. So, um, it, you know, the, if you were to take the speaker apart, you would see that the tweeter has its own uh, enclosure and that that whole module is, is, is the same. Um, and, and that's what you can literally pull that out and put that into a legend. Um, Polk has been using ring radiator tweeters for, I think, around 20 years. They were first introduced in LSI, and I think LSI was first introduced in 2002 or 2004. Um, so the, we continue to evolve that. Um, the, this tweeter, um, so LSI's original tweeter, um, we bought from somebody else. But after that, the engineering team has continued to iterate and evolve it to what we want. And so I think that's it's a question I always get is like, are you buying other people's transducers? Are you buying other people's stuff? No, we have acoustics and transducers engineers in Baltimore who basically designed this, these, these, uh, these drivers. And so this is our own design. Um, and uh, it's a, for those that don't know, ring radiators are considered soft dome tweeters. That little pointy thing, that's what we call it, pinnacle, is because um, it's the best we've done so far. It also has that little point on it. Um, that's actually a waveguide, and that helps with the dispersion of the speaker, of the, of the driver itself. It um, allows it to, you have a little bit broader sweet spot from a listening standpoint. Um, and this tweeter, um, is uh, plays very high. It plays way beyond what you can hear. It's, that's why it's high res certified, um, up to 40 uh, kilohertz. But if you look at that frequency response, it's very smooth, very flat. Extends well beyond, you know, um, you know, 30, 32 kilohertz um, easily. You can see how smooth it is. It's going out. You know, you get that. You start to get a dip, um, uh, you know, at right around 30 hertz. But it's still very smooth beyond that. And then you get the dip closer to 40 kilohertz. So you can see it, it's it's very flat. Um, the uh, red line that you're looking at on that screen is um, the Legend and Reserve uh, ring radiator tweeter. Um, the green line is actually our previous generation ring radiator tweeter. Um, so you can see how we've improved it. So it's um, we improved on sensitivity, we improved on its overall response in terms of how flat it is. Um, but most importantly, we listened and we love the way it sounds. So I think that's that's the most important aspect of it because it may look great on paper, um, and that's a big problem in our industry. Is like things look great on paper, but <laughs> just because it looks great on paper, it doesn't mean it's going to sound good, right? I mean, you can have, I mean, think about it, like a headphone spec, right, or an earbud spec. Earbuds will say they play from, you know, eight kil 18 kilohertz all the way up to 24 kilohertz, or 18 uh, hertz up to 24 kilohertz. Um, it doesn't mean that it, it, it that means nothing, right? In terms of how it's going to sound um, and how it's going to image and and what the bass response is going to be like. So that's that's one of the challenges I think most consumers have is, you know, how do I know what's going to sound good? Because on paper it looks great, but who knows? So that's that, that's definitely one of the challenges that are out. There. And that's a good point, Mike, because I'm glad you brought that up. Because if you pretty much any speaker from bookshelf on will play, you'll see if you looked at it's. Um, uh, 50 hertz to 12,000 or like 15 kilohertz, right. it's plus or minus 3 dB, but they all sound completely different. So so it's kind of hard to take something as just a, a chart or a graph and really get an understanding. But like I said, one well, thing a lot more that goes time. into it, right? I mean, a lot goes into it, right? So let's just talk about that for a second, right? Think about when that speaker, when that driver moves, right? It moves in and out, right? Mm -hmm. So it's vibrating, it's making sound. So what happens to that? Well, first of all, you have a cabinet, which we'll talk about. So that cabinet, like think of it like strings on a guitar. You strum the strings on the guitar, the guitar bass, the body of the guitar starts to vibrate and you start to hear that. Same thing happens with the cabinet, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that when the cabinet vibrates, it's making sounds you don't want to hear. You want to hear your movie or music. You don't want to hear the cabinet. The second thing that affects acoustics and probably the number one thing that affects most people's acoustics, assuming you have a good quality speaker and good amplifier, is your room. Your room will make things sound radically different. Um, and so a lot of people don't realize that, that, you know, if you have a room that isn't, you know, designed for listening um, or isn't treated or, you you know, it's very overly bright or it's, you know, it's, it's really big and you've got little speakers in there, that will affect how things sound, you know, a lot. The last thing is, is that, um, you know, again, on paper, 
there's a lot of specs. And I know everybody, we live in a world because we're buying online because of COVID. Everybody's looking for like that magic number. It's like, oh, this number is bigger, so it's got to be better. And unfortunately, with loudspeakers, it's not. And I go back to, I, I know I'm repeating myself a little bit. Remember, speakers are a combination of art and science, right? Mm -hmm. The art is making it sound good. The science is how do we try to get the best speaker we can for the price we're trying to sell it at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like I said, and, and one thing you talked about last time you were here is you first you listen to it. And then a lot of times you say something's fishy here. And and then you try to figure out what the, you use, you, then you use some of these, the tests and, and the, and the measurements to see if you can figure out what was it that you saw that was that was making it sound a little a little funky right. and then so how do you correct it right yep so you're looking at um a plot of the tweeter and on the left side you can see there's a ridge line in there and that ridge is an unwanted resonance basically it's unwanted sound and so what we we looked at it and this was something that, that uh, the engineers identified not just from the graph but from listening and they're like, you know, can we do something about that? And so we went into the enclosure of the tweeter and we added some damping material called Dacron to it um, and it knocked that down. And so now when you look on the right, that ridge line is gone. And um, uh, and so by just adding, by making a small adjustment, we affected how the tweeter sounds. And obviously you're never gonna see this graph unless we show it to you. So it's, <laughs> it's not like this is a, a selling tool or something like that. But you know, it's it helps you. It it just it illustrates the tension of detail, and it and it illustrates also the relationship between listening and measuring. And mm -hmm. because you can't just measure your way to a perfect speaker, and mm -hmm. and that's I think the important takeaway here. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a fine balance, like I said, between um, using your ears and using your graphs to find the the right solution. So the next thing we want to talk about is the the turbine coned woofer because a mid bass. Um, woofer because that right. is a unique looking being too. If you look at the the ring radiator, it stands out because right. of its waveguide. And when you look at the, the um, this transducer, it also stands out. So can you talk about why it has this look um, and then what's going on because it's pretty unique. Right. So you know, um, just a couple points of clarification on nomenclature. So if the speakers like the R700 has dedicated woofers, we'll kind of describe this as a, as a, as a mid-range driver. If it's a case like the um, bookshelves, you'll hear it either referred to as a mid-base driver because it handles the mids and the base, or you could just call it a woofer. Um, depending, if you look at other speaker brands, they'll call everything um, a woofer unless it's a, um, uh, unless there is actually a dedicated mid-range. So those two terms are kind of interchangeable at this point. In terms of the actual trans the cone itself, just to kind of go back a little bit. So typically, remember a cone's moving like this very fast, right? So with that, what do you want? What you really want is you want something that's lightweight so that the motor that's driving it doesn't have to, can, can, because it needs to work dystonically and that we call that linearity, right? So it moves in and out the same way every single time. Um, we need it to be stiff because if the, if, the, if the cone material isn't stiff, what you can get is you can get kind of like movement on the cone, which creates resonances, that modal resonances, which we don't want. Um, and then, so you want stiffness, you want it um, to be light, and then you also want it to be damped, meaning you don't want it to uh, ring like a bell. So if you think about it, we could make a cone out of steel. That's great, it's really stiff. Well, it's also heavy, so that's not good, and it rings like a bell. Well, we could make it out of aluminum. Well, that's two out of three are good, right? It's lightweight and it's stiff, but aluminum rings like a bell. So what we have is we have a custom material that we've been um, using. This is probably again about third or fourth generation of doing this, and so we keep refining it. Um, and it's an aerated, it's a foam center. So this is a polypropylene cone with a foam center. And so you're looking at a microscopic view of the center. And so let's talk about what that means. So if you think about it, you think about it like um, you could think about like an Oreo cookie, right? So you have hard two sides, which are hard, which are polypropylene, and in the center, you have foam. And so the way this is made is in the, in, in the, in the injection molding process, what happens is, is that the, the mold is open slightly and it allows the center to foam. What that does is it basically creates a composite structure, right? So you think about it, you end up having three layers. There's a benefit to that. 
the, the benefit to the three layers is, is, is a couple things. One is when you have a composite structure, it now handles all, it handles modal resonances very, very well. It also will increase the stiffness. And because we haven't added any additional material during the process, we are keeping the same weight, right? The same mass. So we're achieving the goals of light, stiff, and damped. Mm -hmm. With regard to the turbine cone with Legend, we went and did some, we changed the formula because it's a proprietary formula for the, for the foaming. And then second thing that we did was we molded into the cone these ridge lines. And you'll notice it's an asymmetrical set of ridge lines. By molding it into the cone, you're not again adding any material because you're just taking the existing material and adding these ridges. And what those ridges we found did was do they increase the stiffness of the cone and they break up the modal resonances. So on the left side, as you can see, our previous generation turbine cone and the red is the resonance. And on the right side, you can see how it gets broken up. And there are they are still there, but they're very small. They're not audible. They're not going to be an issue for the cone at all. And so that's an example of where um, we have continued to refine. And that's the level of detail that we go into when we're designing these speakers. And this is again all done in, in Baltimore, Maryland, in the US. Exactly. And and I mean and, and like Mike can go in and if you talk, if you bring in Scott, they can go in and break down all of the different things they did to the vine to to uh, to build this this drive these drivers and the care that they took. I mean, they, we can go way 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 down the rabbit hole. But I mean, this little things that um that I noticed, they, they sent me a chart before that had a million different every single piece of this thing. There's a reason for it. But just things like this, the dual the dual opposed spiders, because that the little spider thing along with the surround is what keeps the, the uh, keeps the woofer moving straight back, um, forward and back inside of the magnetic field. Um, the voice call moves properly inside of the magnetic field of the magnet to make the speaker move. By using dual spiders, you keep that more aligned, means you can drive it a lot harder. So between the light stiff um, cone, things like the dual spiders and things like that, you can drive the woofer harder and um, or the mid bay or the mid woofer harder, which gives you a lot more impact from the sides of the speaker that we are utilizing. And one thing that I that if you've ever heard a pair of these bookshelves, they sound a lot bigger um, than than what they are. And that all all this stuff that Mike is talking about all is about how do I get it to sound to get great bass, but still main, ensure that that bass is clean. Um, and accurate, and and all of this science is a is, there's a method to to the to the thought process of these polk of these polk engineers. So, and like I said, the whole goal is um, easy slide in the world, <laughs> good, good right. detailed mid range and effortless bass. And he talked about Matthew Polk, and that was kind of his thing, right, Mike? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, all this stuff doesn't matter if the speaker doesn't sound good, right? So you can put exactly. all the all the stuff you want in it you can make the cabinets as pretty as you want but at the end of the day it's all about how it sounds so. exactly um now um frederick do you have any questions about the drivers before we move into the newest of the new tech <laughs> which is coming out yes we do actually um let's have a look for in terms of drivers there was one question um let me quickly have a look uh 2337 Yes, uh, the R500 and the R600, do you consider those two ways or two and a half ways? Two and a half ways. So the, um, the R700 is three ways, the, the others are two and a half ways. So we cascade the mid-base drivers so that um, the, uh, so they don't actually play the exact same thing. We do that on purpose. Um, and we also do that on the, um, R3, uh, the R350, which is the, uh, the center, the slim center. Uh, the LCR center. And we do that because if you had them all playing the same thing, you would have a lot of energy at those frequencies and it would become fatiguing to listen to, or you might have a really muddy mid range. Um, there's a whole bunch of issues with that. So typically what we do is we will cascade those. Um, unless the only time you'll see a uh, three-way design is if there is a dedicated tweeter mid and woofer. Okay, a question about the same uh, R350, uh, which is the LCR center. Uh, Phil, can we have a look at the back? Is there any switch or something? Because LCR means you can have it as a left, a center, and a right speaker. 
Yeah. Is there any way to set it to act as a center or as a left center R, as a left or a right speaker? Well, you'll see that in the back, it's just the keyholes. But but the big thing about this, you want to talk about the Diapolito configuration of this, because um, um, this type of this type of configuration works well um, for dispersion for as an LCR as a as a left and right, and it works very well this way. It's one of the benefits of having the 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 tweeter and the woofers configured in this particular location. A lot of times you'll see floor standing speakers where they'll actually have the um, the tweeter in the middle. I don't know, a lot of times you want to have it at the top because it's closer to ear level, but I've even seen this on, on floor standing speakers. Anything else you want to comment about that, Mike? Uh, no, I think you covered it. I mean, we've done a lot of listening with it and it works well in both configurations. We didn't feel it was necessary to have some type of switch. Like the switch that's on the height module is really a tweeter attenuation switch. And so um, we did not feel that we needed to have something like that. Yeah, yeah. Because it's safe to assume yeah. So it's so safe to say that the dispersion back. pattern on the, if you put it, the 350 vertical or horizontal, it's pretty much equal. It's very equal because, again, they're cascaded. Remember, we're not actually also, the outside drivers are playing lower frequencies than the inner drivers, right? So that's what we mean by cascade. Um, you also notice the tweeter is just slightly offset. So what you can do is you can determine if you want the tweeter on the inside or the outside slightly offset. So you, there are some things that we've done. Um, specifically to help with having a large sweet spot because that's going to be important because most of your dialogue is going to come through there and then we also want to make sure it would work both in the horizontal and vertical positions. Okay, there was a question about foam surrounds on the mitts. I don't think we're using foam, we're using rubber surrounds, right? Correct. They are, they are, um, uh, they are a... Um, the butyl a rubber? Butyl, yeah, they're a butyl rubber surround. Um, on some of our speakers, we use a nitrate surround, um, but I believe these are beautiful rubber surrounds. Yes, that's one thing that I paid attention to when I bought my first uh, speakers when I arrived in Hong Kong with my first paycheck. I got my CD, I went into a shop somewhere in an obscure little attic, and uh, I listened to different speakers. I saw Paul Cordio, that was the best sounding one for me, and I noticed that the surrounds, because Hong Kong is very humid, the rubber surrounds are safe. The foam surrounds after two, three years, they will disintegrate and you're up for a new version. So that's one important selling point. Good. Now, in terms of the down firing port, uh, the output if from the down firing port, if you're using carpet or hard floors, is there any difference in how it responds? Not really, because if you, go ahead, Phil. I was gonna say, we're about to go down that port rabbit hole pretty quickly. So, <laughs> because look, as soon as he starts answering this, he's going to be answering what's going on with all of the ports. So, so they thought he's going to talk about why, whether you put it on carpet or floor, um, the base is consistent from the port, and that's kind of the, has the reason why the base looks the, the the platform or the base the speaker sits on looks a little different. Right. So, we got to keep the rest of the questions for later because they fit with the subjects. Okay. So, speaking of ports. Somebody queued that up pretty. Thank you, Frederick, for, for queuing that up and like the, the, the nice slow pitch so Mike can knock it out of the park. park. There's a couple of new technologies that we that, um, that Polk has added or a newer technology that Polk has added to improve the performance of the cabinet and the base. And, you, and Mike had mentioned that if you look at the back of the bookshelf speaker, the port behind it looks different than any other port you may have seen. So, Michael, can you talk a little bit about the export? Sure. So, um, we'll talk about, so do you want me to talk about export first and then go back to PowerPort to answer Frederick's question, or do you yeah, want yeah, me to let's, do that? Let's, let's, do, let's do that first, because I think it's a better, it's a more simple, it's a simpler journey. So start with export, and then we'll okay. get to PowerPort. Okay, so one of the things that you'll, ports, um, not only do they expel air, right? And that is called chuffing. We call that chuffing and that makes noise. And we, we address that in one way, but they also can resonate. And they can resonate in a way that we don't want. So what we were looking at trying to do was how do we how do we get rid of that, that resonance? Um, and so we started experimenting with what are called eigentone filters. And that's um, a mouthful I know. Um, and what we ended up finding was we ended up finding a solution that was quite wonderful because what it did was it addressed 
both port and you can tune an eigentone filter in two places. So we can address either one or both port resonances and cabinet resonances. And what we found, even though it's in the port, was that it actually didn't, it, what didn't affect base response, it actually affected the mid range at about 800 um, hertz. And so we'll show you a graph on that, but what it ends up doing is it cleans up the mid range. And, it's, and so when you talk about a smooth mid range or a detailed mid range, you can hear the difference. And so he's got a slide here that basically shows that that little peak, and that's around um, 800 Hertz, is very audible. And what we did initially when we were experimenting with this, we actually took a pair of signature speakers. We took a pair of signature S20s, the large uh, six and a half inch two ways. Um, and what we did was we modified the port with this eigentone filter. And we did listening sessions with just um, our, our sales team and just normal people to see if they could hear the difference. And you could absolutely hear the difference. And they all described it as it being more open and, and, and more detailed. So we, we knew we were onto something. So this is one of those technologies that we've been kind of experimenting and building with. If you feel you wanna go back to the slide, let's take a look at what it actually is. So on the left side, you're looking at a render of a bookshelf speaker, right? So to orient you, the right side is the front of the speaker with the tweeter on the top and, and the turbine cone underneath it. If you go behind the tweeter, you'll notice that's the port. So um, below it, the black on the bottom is the binding post. So, so we're gonna talk about that upper left side where the port is. The black tube is the actual port tube. So everything else, so normally what we would put back there is just that port tube. And that port tube is sized to be tuned at a certain frequency. So specific to the size of the speaker. If you look at that port tube and you move your eyes towards the tweeter, you'll notice that there looks like there's a tube within a tube. And it has um, three different like you know, plastic pieces which are holding it in place. That tube within the tube is the eigentone filter. And in that tube, there is a cutout where we have specifically put that cutout actually tunes for that port resonance that we're trying to get rid of. And at the other end, that's closer to the tweeter, you can't see it, there is another tuning which addresses cabinet resonances. And so that right there is, is export. So export is, the, is, is that eigentone filter inside that port tube. Now, initially when we did this, we were really concerned that by putting something in the port, it's gonna make more noise. We're like, oh, this is gonna be bad. So we, so of course we started, we wanted to understand the impact of putting something inside the port tube from a noise standpoint. Turns out, Sometimes, you know, um, it turns out it actually reduced port noise. We made the port tube a little larger, we did some things, but it actually reduced port noise. And so this is why on all the speakers that are ported, it has this technology inside of it. But only on the two large floor standards does it also have power port. Because what we found was export was, was good enough, actually really good, at reducing port noise from airflow. And so there was no need to add power port to those particular speakers. Mm -hmm. So all the bookshelves, the large center channel, and the small R500 floor standard, they all have export only in them, but they don't need power port. And that's why the R600 and R700 have power port in addition to that. And we have yeah. a cutaway that shows how we actually integrate power port with export. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, and that combination is what we refer to in the marketing literature as power port 2.0. Yeah, and, um, that's, and that's a big deal because if you think about the amount of bass that's going to, or the amount of air volume that's coming out of that large enclosure there, um, now we start talking about um, uh, now adding the, the, the power port. And like I said, here's the, the cutaway here, Mike, kind of shows, like you said, the combination of the two. And this right. allows you now to answer that question that Frederick had asked about carpeting and hardwood floors. Correct, and so you'll notice, you'll see that large aluminum base, and you'll notice that molded into, uh, not molded, um, that's, that's aluminum, so it's all one piece, it's actually kind of interesting, is the power port diffuser, right? The, the Hershey Kiss looking diffuser. So it doesn't really matter what the floor type is. The reason it's actually on the bottom is that we actually allow, we use the floor actually for base coupling, so you actually get more base it's almost like putting a subwoofer in the corner so you get the boundary reinforcement so it doesn't really matter what the floor is because remember 
the energy from the port is going to exit and it's going to basically be diffused by that by the power port so you minimize the amount of uh, chuffing that you hear you minimize the amount of turbulence looking at that cutaway you, it's cut in half to orient you um, and at the lower part closest to the base you'll see a large um, semicircle that's been cut in half that's actually the port and you can see how it has um, a curved flange on the top and a curved flange on the bottom that geometry we spent a lot of time with to make sure that that because the whole purpose of that is to make sure that you have smooth what they call laminar flow which means that it's smooth airflow minimal amount of turbulence Remember I talked about kind of the egg and tone filter is this kind of tube within a tube. So now you're looking at the tube within a tube and it's cut in half. And you can see about two thirds of the way down, there's a cutaway there. That cutaway is specifically put there and that's how we do that tuning on it. At the other end, it's, it's, uh, is, is, is the length of the tube and the other end actually allows us to do a secondary tuning to deal with um, any cabinet residences or maybe even a secondary residence in the port which in this case, it's a cabinet residence. So this is when we are combining it with power port and it's not standalone, this is what it looks like. And what all we did was we just wanted to make a distinction between power port without export and power port with export, right? So power port 2.0 is basically the enhanced power port that you find in legend mm -hmm. with export combined. And so we did that just to make uh, a, a distinction so people weren't confused. So they didn't think, oh, well, this has PowerPort, so it has export. No, if you don't see PowerPort 2.0, it doesn't have export inside of it. Exactly. And the PowerPort has been proven to, to really improve um, the base, clean it up, reduce that huffing and chuffing. Um, actually, one of the um, uh, reviewers, Youthman, and I think you took a bunch of those guys, um, a lot of um, Youthman and a bunch of guys to, um, to, to the facility in Maryland, to and when when they when when uh when I believe when Legend came out and you did demonstrations with um, speakers with PowerPort and without PowerPort and if you go look at Youthman's video I haven't checked uh um, Techno Dad and everybody else but if you go to Youthman's video you can actually see them play um uh a, two different speakers one with and one without and even on camera through your computer it is blatantly obvious the benefit of um, a power port or enhanced power port. So that technology alone is proven, and you'll see that on, on Legend, you'll see that on Polk subwoofers, but now this has just been um, taken to the next level. Right. So with, let me just talk about that for a second. So power port does not allow the speaker to play lower tones. It does not. What happens when you play low frequencies, you get a lot of air moving through the port that air movement makes noise. It makes a fluttering sound. You can try this at home. If you take, if you get a tone generator off your phone and play a 40 kilohertz tone, if you're talking about floor standing speakers, um, I think probably bookshelves might have to be a little higher. And you just play that tone only. Don't play music, don't play movies, because what you're doing is, what you just want to do is say, you want to hear the difference between the port noise and the actual tone. And so what power port does is it reduces that port noise so you can hear more of the low frequency tone that you want to hear. And so the video that he's referring to is we took one of our favorite competitors that's ported and we basically put it against an equivalently priced Polk speaker only playing that 40 hertz tone. And you can hear the difference in sound. We call that chuffing or, or you'll hear it. it's a flutter sound. And you can literally do this at your home. If you go into a hi-fi shop and you have some friends there and you know, they want to experiment, you could absolutely do this. And it's something you can hear as long as you don't want to obviously in a crowded space with lots of noise, you need to have a semi-quiet room, but you can absolutely hear the difference. And that's what this graph is showing is that, that the additional noise being made by the port that's unwanted. And that's what power port does. It eliminates that. It also um, allows the product to be, uh, have some forgiving placement. So you, if you are putting it, like I said, floor firing, or you're putting, uh, some of our bookshelf speakers actually have it, so if you literally are putting it in a bookshelf, and you might not want that port firing into the wall or into the back of the bookshelf, it allows for that. But it's, um, th this was originally invented, um, uh, the, the um, uh, patent is uh, dates back to 1998, 
and it was it came out with a speaker that was launched in 1997. It was a very large SDA speaker, and the issue was was that the port tube was actually too long for the cabinet. It was going to stick out the back. So Matthew Paul had this idea: what if we turned it and made it vertical, like it is today? Then he's like, okay, now I got a problem because I'm firing into the floor and that's gonna make a whole bunch of noise that I don't wanna make. So that's when he first enveloped the idea of power port with this idea of this kind of this diffuser. And so over the years, over the past you know, 20 plus years, what we've done is we've continued to refine it on top of that. And so when you, every time you see a curve in power port, whether it's in the base or it's in the flange, all of that geometry Originally, when back in, when they first invented it, a lot of that was just done through trial and error. Mm -hmm. Now we can do computer modeling. And so we basically model this stuff out and then we measure it, obviously, after we model it out. And so every time we bring a new speaker to market that has power port, we always go back and ask ourselves the fundamental question of what can we do to make it better? And so that's what you're seeing. And part of the naming conventions that you're seeing is we're just trying to describe that evolution. And we might have been better off just saying, PowerPoint version one, version two, version three, version four, but we we didn't do that for whatever reason. So we're we're now at Legend has enhanced PowerPoint. Signature just has kind of think of it as almost like vanilla PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Um and then Reserve has the enhanced PowerPoint from Legend mm -hmm. integrated with export, and that's what we call PowerPoint 2.0. So let me let me check my old polk history. Um the first was that the SRT? Yes. That's the, yes. And I remember that speaker when it came out. I think it came with a warning and an SBO meter because they said it could hurt you. So I it's thought that was. It's, it's a beat. It's, <laughs> we have them in the lobby in Baltimore. We still have a pair in the lobby. And they're like five feet tall, five and a half <laughs> feet tall. I mean, they're, 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 they're you know, most, most, small well, most children. Most uh, not most adolescent children could fit inside them. I mean, they're, they're <laughs> massive speakers. They were done back in the day when you know the whole thing was you know they had multiple driver arrays and when you take the front off you know you're going to see these massive driver arrays because it was an sda speaker um they had these massive woofers underneath um when you when they were fully outfitted they were selling i believe for um i think like twelve thousand a pair or yeah, something they something were like they were they were pretty they, they they, were but they were outstanding there. and that was back in 1997 so you know so they were they were they were they were they were a lot of fun to listen to, um, and you know they were they were very they were very revolutionary for their time. Um, but you know, as as the significant other says, you're not putting those in my house. <laughs> <laughs> they were for a dedicated room most of the time. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sure so out there. Yeah, so, so that's call, where that's yeah, so that's, <laughs> yeah, Super Legend was kind of an homage back to that time, right? So if you look at the L800, it is a big big speaker. It's a monster speaker, right? And so um, you know, it's it, but it's a lot of fun to listen to, and it's basically taking the SDA of the, that was the last SDA speaker that came out, um, and then basically puts it on steroids with the L800. Now, now, there's one more thing we want to talk about. So we talk about you mentioned that a speaker is a combination of of things. You know, you have your drivers, and you want to make sure that they just play the sound without adding anything, any distortion, any ringing, any resonances. Um, you want to make sure that the port does not have uh, any kind of chuffing and huffing and port noise. Right. The last thing is, like you mentioned, a guitar. If you string on a string on a guitar, the body vibrates. Um, vibration of a cabinet is bad. So you guys work really hard to eliminate um, cabinet resonances um, right. in a very effective way. So, so let's talk a little bit about that. Right, so if you were just think about a, a, a driver on a speaker, it moves in and out, right? When it moves out, it's pushing energy out. When it moves back, it's pushing energy back into the cabinet. So the cabinet has to be strong enough to deal with that energy, right? And what we really want that energy to do is go out the port to make bass. We don't want it to go to the cabinet and to the cabinet to vibrate because that's going to make sounds that we don't want, right? So we want to, so we like the energy that's coming, you know, from the driver, but we want it to be focused and controlled. So the way we do that is we, we, we call it critical bracing, and we critically brace the cabinets. In the old days, we would brace everything, right? We just would, you know, let's just throw MDF at the problem and brace, brace, brace the heck out of it. Um, but now we have technology, we have a laser vibrometer, and that's what he was showing you before, 
well, we can actually measure the vibration of panels. And so if you look on the far left side, you can see the back side of the speaker. You can see in that instance where we were measuring this, the red means that it's vibrated. And so we want to get rid of that. So how do we get rid of that? So we, let's go to the next screen. So the way we do that is inside the cabinet, you'll see bracing. So we not only do we use, depending on the speaker, the, the thickness of the MDF, that's uh, you know um, um, uh, the MDF that's actually used, um, but in addition, you can see the bracing. So on the left side is kind of like, um, how do I put this delicately? Um, what say maybe a traditional loudspeaker might have from bracing. And on the right side is what we do on the Polk side in the case of reserve. We actually spend a lot of time and energy on bracing. And we always, I always tell the story um, when people come to Baltimore, because sometimes we'll have competitive product there. And when we tear the competitive product down, we always want to look to see where they're spending their money, right? Because you have to make choices. Speakers are a set of compromises. And so, you know, sometimes they're spending it on how it looks. Sometimes they're spending it on their transducers. Sometimes they're spending it on maybe on their cabinet. What we find is a lot of folks don't actually spend a lot of money on their cabinet and bracing. And because part of it, I'm sure, is because the consumer doesn't see that. But we do. And we spend a lot of time and energy making sure that our cabinets are as acoustically inert as we can make them. Um, because the other thing is, if you fill it with a whole bunch of wood, you still need cabinet volume to make sound, right? So you can't just fill the whole thing um, and, and that would be making it very heavy and very expensive, <laughs> but you at the same time. So we wanna have something that's well braced, it doesn't vibrate, um, and, and we only wanna brace it where it needs to be braced, right? Let's not add bracing that's unnecessary because when you reduce cabinet volume, you actually reduce your, your low end output, right? Your base output. So it's important that we, and or you say, well, just make it bigger. Well, then now you're running into the issue if you're making a really big loudspeaker when people want smaller loudspeakers. So that's kind of where I said, it's a set of trade-offs. So on the graph, you're looking at that red hump at sitting at, you know, it looks like around 180 Hertz um, is where you're actually getting a cabinet resonance. So in this case, we're getting a vertical resonance, a standing wave inside there and it is audible and we want to address it. So what we did with the, we came up with this other idea, which we call column resonance control, CRC for short, it's in the R700. And it's in the R700 because the R700 is so big relative to everything else. And if you'll notice on the right side, there is a board or MDF board that parallels the back side and the front side of the cabinet. It goes, it goes from the very top to about halfway down. By adding that additional brace in there, and it has an open cavity, so it's, so it's the air can get in there. What we've done is we eliminate that particular resonance, and you can see the delta between the two. Um, and it's going from uh, 27 down to about 16. So it's you know it's it's actually not 6 dB. It's probably closer to 11 or 12. Yeah. But um, that's beside beside the point. The purpose of showing this to you is that first of all, most people will never see the inside of the cabinet. Number two <laughs> is to show the level of detail. And again, it goes back to First and foremost, we measure it, and then we ask ourselves, can you hear it? And in this case, it's something that is audible, and so we wanted to address that in that speaker. Um, and, uh, and so it's just it's just another piece of technology. When you, um, you know, people always like to knock on speakers, right? They knock on the top, they knock on the side. That kind of tells you a little bit of how things are braced. When you knock on a Polk speaker, on the, on the Polk Reserve speaker or the Legend speaker, it's gonna sound, it's, you're gonna hear a, a thud, right? And you're not gonna hear like, a, sounds like echoey or open. Um, and that's just because it's so, it's it's braced really, really well, because we don't, we want you to hear your music in movies, not the cabinet. And, and like, and, and one thing we just wanna point out is, um, this shows the amount, the attention to detail and the care that went into the reserve. So while the reserve um, fits at a, the, like you said, is at that um, RTI original price point, the development that went into the speaker means it is not just a replacement of, of, of RTI. They took all of these great technologies, the, a huge amount of advancements are, right. are found in this speaker, which is one of the reasons why it performs, why these speakers perform so well when it comes to, um, um, when you're listening to them. The bass is full, it's rich, they sound bigger than what they are. Um, and I challenge you, to find a speaker, a bookshelf speaker or floor setting speaker that align with these speakers at their price points that could come close to these. These will, these you would have to spend double. It's just the way, it's just the way it is. And the reviews are already coming out and people are saying all over the world, wow, these speakers sound 
spectacular. So um, we're getting towards the hey, end. We got about, go yes, ahead. I was going to say we only have about eight minutes left, so yeah. I think we need to wrap up it's since you Q have a hard cut, right? It's Q and A time. I think um, I think we can now cover as it's a rapid fire Q and A because I have to punch out exactly at nine thirty, and I think Mike does too. All right, so so go ahead, Frederick, fire away. Yes, I will consolidate it in two big questions. One, and there's a lot of people asking about this, about ceiling, in ceiling, or CI speakers in wall that match the uh, reserve series, or is that on the way? Is it possible to also include that technology, the pinnacle tweeters and the turbine woofers? Not sure how far we can elaborate on this. Is there something that matches right now that we have? Um, we don't have anything that matches um, today. Um, the uh, the closest so um, you know uh, it, I I can't talk about future development but you know if you look at the history of Polk traditionally um, LSIM had the LS in ceiling RTI had the RT series signature um, the the tweeter and signature and the tweeter and the V series are, are is, is uh, very similar so those are timbre matched so there's usually um, an architectural series that's that is timbre matched to that. Um, we don't have something like that at this point. Um, the good news is, though, is that um, you could use you could use any of those three I just mentioned, especially when you're talking about elevation speakers, because elevation speakers don't play full range, and they're usually and they're not on all the they're not on initially all the time playing. Uh, and so, from a blending standpoint and and from a, an acoustic standpoint, you can. Um, it's it's common for people to use different um, in ceiling speakers than they have on their front stage. Um, uh, so it's if that's your goal, I think you're you're fine using either RT or you could use um, the B series um, with this, and you would be just fine doing so, especially if you're just using them for height. You know what, Mike? There's one more thing. Question. This actually makes reminds me that we need to talk about real quick, and that is the certifications and compatibility. Because I'm sure that's going to be that's probably a couple of the questions that are in there. So um, yep. the speakers have an IMAX enhanced certification, um, which means you know IMAX is the biggest, boldest mixes, and is to ensure that you can deliver um, the output with the clarity that would meet the um, standards of IMAX. Now DTS X does not have a certification, but the base of IMAX enhanced, the layer that IMAX enhanced is built upon is DTSX. So if it can handle right. IMAX enhanced, it's going to do great on, DT, uh, on DTSX. Um, the um, high risk certification has to do with that high frequency response and the detail and the pinnacle tweeter, no problem for that certification. Can you talk a little bit about Dolby Atmos? Sure. So with Dolby Atmos, we are compatible. With DTSX, we're compatible. Or 3D, we're compatible. And DTSX doesn't have a certification process, but because if you think about IMAX and DTS are kind of joined at the hip, the IMAX certification almost serves as a DTSX certification. Um, Dolby Atmos. So because we chose to make a combination on speaker and on wall device, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, uh, it's the and if you look at our competitors as well, we're not alone. We're not going to um, check all the boxes to be certified. So it's not certified. But with that said. Um, this speaker does very, very well um, on wall. It does very, very well on topper, and that's why we have the slider switch on there. And um, if you use it in a Atmos home theater, you're going to be very happy with it. So the certification is just one of Dolby's ways of saying, hey, we bless this. But in our case, um, we're obviously very familiar with um, Dolby um, Atmos, and we um, and we understand what it takes to sound good. And again, that's that's what's important. It's not necessarily what's on paper, but what's how does it sound. Right, and so obviously with um, our, our the the brands, Sound United sister brands of Denon and Marantz, we obviously know a lot about um, home theater, and mm -hmm. and we have a lot of tools at our disposal to make sure that the speakers that we design work really well with that equipment and sound great. Okay, so okay, thank you. I wanted to cover that. So Frederick, next question. Yeah, there was a couple of questions about passive and active. I explained that Polk uses the uh, vented ported uh, architecture, whereas ZT is using seal types. It's why they use base radiators to tune. So that's kind of covered. Uh, what I wanted to ask you, Michael, is in terms of sound signature of the reserve compared to the legends and compared to the signature series, 
So we know that with Signature, it evolved into a Signature E type. So there was a bit of a European voicing rather than just the American type sounds. So the attempt for the reserve in the legend was to get a bit more of a global voicing. Could you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, so um, it's a, there's there's a couple different camps out there. Um, at the end of the day, it's, you know, good sound is good sound. So um, what we wanted to do with reserve was um, we wanted to be true to the Matthew Polk um, vision for sound. And at the same time, we wanted to make sure that we had um, a sound signature that uh, appeal globally. So these are considered, uh, there is, it's the same SKU everywhere. So if you buy a SKU in Hong Kong, it's the exact same model is sold in the U.S. There's no difference at all. Um, and like I said, the Europeans have already started, the reviews from globally have coming in right. and they've all been outstanding and the ones in America right. have been outstanding. So it's a sound that is pleasing to everyone. Right. But it, but it, it was, it's, so again, we don't want to make speakers to, it's not like crowdsourcing a sound, right? So we're not doing that, right? So that's not the goal here. The goal here is to make a great sounding speaker that lives up to the Polk vision for what it should be, which mm -hmm. is that lots of detail, front row experience. So again, sound stage is gonna be a little bit more forward, right? That's what you're gonna feel. A lot of bass extension um, and, that, and then that very smooth mid range. Um, and those are the aspects that we continue to strive for when we do these things. So I don't want to leave people with the impression that, oh, well, we changed our sound. No, we didn't change our sound. What we've done is we had a situation in, with Signature that was unique to Signature where there were some preferences. And if you listen to Signature E, it has those same three elements. It has detail, soundstage, bass. What we did was we, we changed it, we tuned the bass actually, the, the changes there were primarily with that bass tuning. Um, and, but it's, but it's all true to the Polk vision and the Polk sound. And this okay. is, and with reserve, you have one model, it's the same everywhere. Okay, and there's one more thing I wanna point out because people ask, you know, what about a subwoofer? Um, right now, the recommended, the, the, a great subwoofer to pair with it would be a, um, an HTS-10 or an HTS-12. These subwoofers, um, like I said, it, you, utilize the power port, and like I said, a lot of the, um, Polk put a lot of care into these subs. The big guys retail for about $500 US, and our and our booth at CES, we actually ran four HTS-12s with our legend system, and people were stunned at the, right. at the, at the bass response. So, so the, um, even these woofers sound amazing um, for their, um, and like I said, you'd have to spend double to get close to what these guys are more than double to what you can get from from these so this is a good um thing to actually pair if you're looking for subwoofers to go along with your reserve speakers all right frederick um next question uh there's one outstanding question from sumit he would like to know what kind of damping material that we use inside the reserve series so on those white those cutaways you saw the white material is a dacron it's very simple. We use Dacron um, on is our primary damping material on all of our loudspeakers. Um, there might be some other very minor things we do inside a tweeter cavity or things like that, but 95% you know, of what we're using is Dacron. Okay. Okay, great. I think and we don't fill everything. the whole. By the way, we don't fill the whole cabinet with it because if you fill the whole cabinet with it, you basically knock out all the base. You have no base. It'll be point. too so, dead. Yeah, it'd be too exactly. dead. So, so it's so it's strategically placed to address resonances within the cabinet and and so like the cutaway you saw um uh you, all the cutaways you saw that white white stuff and that white stuff is dacron it's it's kind of like um uh corning's fiber type of it's a fiber material so it's not it's not hard it's not like a styrofoam um it's a it's a fibrous material and again it's all strategically placed inside there even that subwoofer has some inside of it we did a cutaway um at a ces one time and people were and they you could see it so yeah that white material in there um, is uh, it's strategically placed uh, to address some um, cabinet residences. Okay, all right. That's it, we've covered everything. Okay, so let's, like I said, so just to recap, um, uh, we wanna stress the fact that um, a lot of the technology we, we discussed today were developed for the legend. And, uh, and, and by making some adjustments to like utilizing um, a, a vinyl um, instead of wood veneers and and reducing some of the finishing details you've been able they've been able to um, 
um, and some other adjustments they've been able to um, to make the um, price point of the reserve even more approachable to others and like I said the performance is outstanding huge amount of, 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 of options um, that you to, they give you just a massive amount of ways to configure them from the three center channels to the the bookshelves the floor standards um, and everything else and like I said un beatable unbeatable value i challenge you to find a speaker at its price points that could match this speaker when it comes to comes to performance so mike anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up no i just like to thank everybody for uh signing in and um i enjoyed uh sharing what i know about reserve and uh so again thank you again yeah and and, and michael thank you for coming check out our sign edit youtube channel if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. We need your support. Tell your buddies about it. Have them come and hang out with us. Um, we have lots of opportunities and, and we get lots of special guests like Michael who can come in and really dive in to the, on the technologies that, are, that, that we're offering. So we have guys, from, um, experts from Polk and, and DTS and everything else. And of course, if you want to find out what's coming up on um, our next upcoming webinars, because now, I actually have a real space that we can actually do some really cool stuff. Um, make sure that you bookmark on your browser the sununited.com backslash webinars so you know what is coming up in the, um, in the near future. So I'd like to thank my, um, my, my team who, who helped me get this done, um, whether it's Frederick and Johan and Eric and Derek and Jen. That, that helped me put these together and and Michael for for um, for coming and hanging out with us. So we'd like to thank everybody for coming and take care and everybody have a great weekend. Bye bye.